morning. Glad you're here. Glad you're watching online. We are going to open scriptures a little bit before we take communion this morning. Uh, that's what Table Sundays are about. We want a, a special time in the Word before we take communion together. Uh, and then as well, give us time in the room to be able to uh, connect together and talk about what's going on and, and have some connection time. So we're, we're going to do that this morning. So sometimes we look at communion and you might think, well, isn't that like a, like a Good Friday thing, right? How, how does it fit with Christmas? So I, I want to put something together this morning just to help us better appreciate this time and this time of gathering and this time especially when we take the cup and the bread around this season and how special it is and how we should look forward to it. This is a great season to do that. One of the things I've talked about with people is that one of the things you should always remember in Scripture is that in the beginning, we have what? We have God is with Adam and Eve in the garden. There is, there is fellowship. There is a sense where there's no boundaries due to sin or anything else. They are together. He is walking with them in the garden. At the end, all the way in the book of Revelation, you would God himself will be with them. You don't find this language anywhere else. It's this idea of dwell, lives with them. So, so at the beginning, he's walking with them, and at the end, he's walking with us, right? This whole idea of with them, this whole idea of dwelling with them. And, and those are the two bookends in your, in your Bibles, uh, whether we understand it or not, whether we think of that or not. Most of us are just stuck in the middle. That's where we are. We're just kind of stuck in this middle period, and that's where all of our Scripture is. I mean, we got a couple chapters right at the beginning and a couple chapters that tell us what the end's going to be like and how we'll live with God, and then there's just in the middle. And in the middle, sin separates, but Jesus died to reconcile. And what I want you to understand is that Christmas is the long-awaited next step of the plan of God. That's really what Christmas is, what we celebrate. The next step that God took, that he set up in Genesis chapter 3 where he says, I am going to provide, uh, it is the first kind of gospel that, that, that there's going to be this enmity, and, and he will strike, and you will strike. There's this whole beautiful picture in Genesis chapter 3 of what's going to happen and what's going to take place. And so finally at Christmas, we get the next step. The next step is what? That Jesus comes, that Jesus lives, that Jesus dies, that Jesus rises again. He ascends to the Father. He sits at the right hand. And now we await his coming, his second coming. And so it's just the next step in God's plan. So whenever we gather at Christmas, whenever it's Christmas time, we're like, oh, this is the next step of God's plan and what God is doing. So this morning, I would like us to look at that Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. You could say it's Paul's Christmas story where Paul, Paul takes what is a very common because it's in quotations. This is really important in your scripture. It's in quotations because it means that Paul did not write this. That this was a part of a hymn, it was part of a creed, it was part of something of the early church that they said all the time. And he pulls it in here to remind us of some things. And these are incredible scriptures to remember and just embrace. And especially this time of year, it, it's awesome to embrace these few scriptures in Philippians chapter 2. So we're going to walk through those this morning before we take communion together and then have some uh, connection time here. So here we go. Who, talk, talking about Jesus, who though he existed in the form of God. Now, I, I want to just remind you that word form is, is very specific in the Greek to what it is talking about. He is fully God. Remember we talked about that last week, this whole idea. He is the king of kings. He is fully God. Now, now watch this idea of form because they do an cr incredible job of picking up this picture. Who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. I got to prove myself all the time. He did, Jesus did not walk around just proving himself all the time that he is God and making sure everybody understood that. He did make sure everybody clearly would know that, but it's not like he just walked around and, that, and that's what he just proclaimed everywhere, okay? He did not 
feel that there was something to be grasped, it was something to be proven, it was something to show everybody else. But he emptied himself by taking on the, and there's that word again, the form. He goes, the form of God, the fullness of God, fully God, to now he empties himself. That is the whole idea of the incarnation. That's all the idea of Jesus coming. He empties himself of all of that. He is in the glory of heaven, and he empties himself to come here and takes the form of a slave by looking like other men and by sharing in human nature, right? That means he's just like us. Hebrews does a great job of picking this up. He says he, just, he was tempted just like us. He suffered just like us. So, so we, have a, we have a high priest. We have someone who knows what it's like. He knows what it's like to stand at the grave. He knows what it's like to have loss. He knows what it's like to experience pain. He knows what it's like. So before you think, oh, God can possibly understand, no, Jesus came, okay, looked like other men, and he shared in human nature so he knows exactly what it's like to walk through the things we walk through in a broken, fallen world. So he empties himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient unto, de- unto the, even the point of death, even death on a cross. That exclamation just reminds us that the death on the cross was the most shameful way you could die in first century. The most shameful way. It, it, it's just unbelievable that crosses appear everywhere now. Uh, we, we don't think of it that way. We think of it, this is, this is where Jesus died. This is, this is where my salvation is from, his death and resurrection. So we have these and we celebrate these. Though they were not celebrated. That was, that was the, 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 the most shameful way to die, was to die on the hands of the Romans through crucifixion. And yet, he even humbled himself to the point that he would take the most shameful route that we would be saved, that we could be redeemed, that we could be rescued. If you ever doubt, I tell you this all the time, but if you ever doubt, I don't know if Jesus really could love me today. Find a cross somewhere, because that said he took the most shameful route in order that we could be rescued, redeemed, and saved. Boy, that's a God who cares. That's a God who loves incredibly and would go to any length to make sure we are redeemed and rescued and our sins can be forgiven and set free. As a result, as a result of choosing the most shameful way that that we could be rescued and redeemed, God highly exalted him. This, This is incredible. He humbles, God exalts. And gave him the name that is above every name. Because this is really important. Because the first time he came, he came what? He came to lay down his life. He came to the last, the lowest, and the least that we could be rescued and redeemed and saved. That is the first time he came. But the next time he comes, well, God has exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. And watch how this ends. Because I love how this ends. Because this just tells us there is a glorious return coming. And for all the people who question and are like, no, God doesn't exist. This Jesus thing's a myth. It tells us, oh, everybody's going to see him. Watch this. So at the name of Jesus, every, and it does mean every, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody will confess that. We get to confess it. Those of us who have found Jesus, who have been redeemed and saved, we get to confess it now. That's great. And there are people who will confess it at the worst moment of their life to realize that their life has been lived for themselves and apart from Christ, and, oh, he really is Lord. Oh, that really was true. I really should have worshipped him. I really should have gave my life to him. When, when, when he called me, when he was, when he was moving in my heart, I, I should have responded to that and not just pushed it aside. Because every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God, of God the Father. And now we look forward to the day of his return. That's the beauty of the Christmas story. The, the, there's, a, there's a song out. I don't know if you've ever heard it. it, it it's an old one, and it's been redone in a couple of ways. Um, and, and, and the word is, this is the title, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. And what, what's great about it, it's both. That the people in Jesus' day, they were waiting. They were waiting for Messiah. 
Now, they had Messiah wrong. They, they wanted a conqueror. They, they, they had missed a lot of their own text, but they, they, had, they had missed it. They wanted a conqueror. They wanted Rome gone, but they were waiting. Please, Messiah, come and rescue and, and save us. They wanted political salvation, not the salvation that Jesus came to offer us. And so they were waiting. And they're like, come, the long-expected Messiah. Okay? We do the same thing. We, we, we're, just, we're just repeating it in a different way, looking for the day of his return. This is why Paul tells us, do you realize that every time, every single time, you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes? It's like it just takes you back there to remember all that he has done for you. All that he's done for you. That's not what it does. It's supposed to take us back and remind us of that. And it's supposed to say, oh, that's right. Come now long expected, Jesus. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being born in the, in the lowest of ways in order to redeem and save a broken and fallen world. Thank you for, for, for calling all of us and that thank you that, that we responded in faith, believing that you are Jesus Christ, the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And we long for the day that you return. But when we get to come together, we get to take communion. That's what should be happening in us. We should be remembering that. We should be looking at that and saying, come thou long expected Jesus. So while this might seem like a Good Friday type thing, setting up for Easter where we take the, bro- the cup and the bread and remember his death, nothing happens until we understand that Jesus empties himself and steps into time and place. That time was the first century. That place was Bethlehem and did everything in order that we could be rescued and redeemed and saved. That, that's amazing. So I'm hoping that today when we take the cup and the bread, it won't just be, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's this time. We, we take it like we always do. But, but it will be a point of reflection a little bit more, maybe a little bit more gratitude, maybe a little bit more reminding, man, this is an awesome season because we get to celebrate that this was the second step. God made a promise. He fulfilled it in Jesus' coming and then sends him to the cross and does all of that to redeem us. This is, this is, Christmas is God's moving towards us to say, I love you. I'm going to do everything to rescue, redeem you, and save you. And he just calls us, come on, what is stopping you from repenting and finding freedom and forgiveness in me? So we're going to pray, and we're going to ask God's blessing in the cup and the bread. And um, guys are going to come and pass it out to everybody this morning. If you're watching online, you can just grab something that you have uh, with you, near you, uh, and and take those elements with us this morning. Uh, as we do, we are gonna we're gonna celebrate. We have forgiveness. We have freedom because of Jesus, and that this season we celebrate all those things, all the goodness and everything that He has done for us. So we're going to ask God's blessing on this, pass it out, and then we will eat and drink together and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. So let's pray. Jesus, the word thank you almost doesn't seem enough at times. When, When we read a passage like this and it tells us that you are in glory, and you emptied yourself and went from the form of fully God to the form of a slave to rescue and redeem us. Undeserving, sinful, broken people. You stepped into time and place. Your first night was spent in a feeding trough in a stable. There is no place you won't go to redeem and save and rescue fallen humanity. You proved it the first night. You proved it the last night when you took the most shameful way to die. And you proved it three days later when you rose again. 
So as we take these elements today, Jesus, our hearts are filled with gratitude and, and just, just overwhelming joy that you would do all of this for us. May we take those with that kind of attitude. May we celebrate this season knowing that this was all your plan to save, redeem, and rescue us. We pray your blessing upon the cup and the bread. Because we are on the other side of the cross, we, we say, come now long expected Jesus to return where every knee will bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. So we take it looking forward to that day. So remind us, Jesus, everything we have is a gift from you. You have been gracious and good and loving and kind to us. You, you laid down your life for us. May we take this today with incredible gratitude, incredible joy, thankful for all that you will continue and will do in our life. We pray all this in Jesus' name.